So hi, y'all. Um, this, uh, this is uh, the name of the talk that Jeremy and I came up with. So it sounds big and impressive instead of uh, what every family physician needs to know, which is what I originally called it. Um, and uh, Dr. Marilyn Singleton uh, is, uh, is the co-author on this because uh, my real learning objective for all of you on, on this is to, to not be where I was before six years ago. Um, I had never even heard the word eugenics uh, before then. And I attended a talk that Dr. Singleton gave on eugenics in America at an AAPS meeting. And uh, my jaw dropped um, and I had not heard much of uh, the history of it. I, and, which is amazing to me because both of my parents were World War II veterans. I would have, you would think I would have heard something about eugenics, but um, no. So even though these are the, the learning objectives we have for you, um, my learning objective for you is to at least be able to, to speak with somebody else about this topic and to recognize um, eugenics as a possible influence on public policies. So as I was putting this uh, talk together, this quote kept coming up in my head. Um, this is from Ecclesiastes, but um, I, had, I had learned it actually in my Latin class, uh, yeah. that there's nothing new under the sun. And um, I think it's important uh, to keep that in the back of your mind as you're, as you're learning this morning. It's still morning here at the Lake of the Ozarks. So uh, here's the definition of uh, eugenics. And um, there's the dictionary. If, if you can see, can you all see the slides? Because I, I don't like having uh, to read yes. for people. Yes, okay. they look good. All right, good. Um, yeah, perfect. And um, the, the fellow who came up with the term purposefully used the uh, prefix EU from Greek meaning well, so that it the, the concept of eugenics is being well-bred or well-born. Um, but eugenics is really any human action whose goal is to improve the human gene pool, especially by selective breeding. So the goal, improve the human gene pool, especially by selective breeding. Now, uh, with any philosophy, they, well, there's positive eugenics and then there's negative eugenics and positive eugenics is selective breeding. Um, and what this made me think of was um, in the 1990s, Melissa Etheridge wanted to uh, have a baby. And so as she was looking for her sperm donor, she was having to decide between uh, David Crosby on one hand, who was a good friend of hers and also a wonderful musician, uh, part of Crosby Stills Nash, uh, and or decide on Brad Pitt as a sperm donor. What kind of uh, choice that is. Uh, but she chose uh, David Crosby. After seeing one of David Crosby and his wife's kids, she looked at that kid and said, I want one of those. So this would be an example of positive eugenics, being able to uh, try to pick and choose selectively what your children are going to be like. Can I ask if you're not speaking, if you could um, mute uh, yourself for me, please? And I, I'm muting some people on administratively here. So afterwards, if you need to be unmuted, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Just uh, thank you. Great, thanks. I'm easily distracted. If I see something shiny, I might forget what I was talking about. Uh, then there's a negative eugenics. And this, in this case, you're removing uh, hopefully certain traits from the gene pool. And what this made me think of was the Darwin Awards. And if you're not aware of what the Darwin Awards are, they, they happen to be quite hilarious actually. Uh, if you'll go to the website, they state, honoring Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, the Darwin Awards commemorate those who improve our gene pool by removing themselves from it in the most spectacular way possible. So it's stories of how people um, 
don't just uh, die <laughs> through through bizarre accidents uh, of their own um, mistakes, but um, there it, it's it's it could be humorous. But this would be an example of negative eugenics, getting those traits out of the gene pool. And as with any philosophy, there are pros and cons. And uh, here's a list of some of the, the pros. As physicians, we are called to lessen human suffering. So if uh, we see that as one of the pros of eugenics, we might say, hey, you know, this is, this is a pretty good, pretty good idea uh, because we, we don't want to have to um, be constantly trying to, to help people if they can uh, avoid that in the first place. And then also if you are, um, how shall we say, uh, into um, decreasing the financial burden on taxpayers, you might also see that as a pro to eugenics. However, and this is a big however, uh, eugenics has quite a few cons. Uh, number one, it's, um, it's immoral to play God. It does provide justification for state-sponsored discrimination. Forced sterilization and institutionalization violates basic civil rights. And then there's this, uh, who gets to define what's defective? Who gets to decide what is defective? Disabled persons can be successful in life. Um, if you are not aware of Dr. Temple Grandin, that's who I'd like to talk about right now. Uh, Dr. Grandin was just recently uh, recognized as one of the top 10 college professors in the United States. She's known for her work in animal behavior and Dr. Grandin is a spokesperson for people with autism because Dr. Temple Grandin with her multiple degrees, her many uh, books that she has written and the hundreds of speeches that she has given uh, is, has autism. And um, so I think she is a grand, Grandin, grand example of how disabled persons can succeed in life. And then here's another thought, um, what appears to be a genetic defect in one context or environment may not be so in another area, such as sickle cell anemia or sickle cell trait um, is very protective in areas so you're gonna, uh, for, against malaria. So you're going to see it uh, wherever malaria is endemic, that which might be considered a genetic defect can actually be protective against other things. So now we're gonna learn a little bit about the history of this, um, this philosophy of eugenics. This is one of my favorite memes. I use it as often as I can. Um, we only have to go back to the about fourth century uh, BC uh, to uh, this fellow uh, named Plato um, who wrote his Republic sometime before 368 BC. And in that he talks about his ideal society. And in this ideal society, there would be three classes. Uh, one class would be the guardian class. And this is predominantly the philosophers and the warriors. And then you've got another class that is the commoners and the farmers. And then a third class would be the craftsmen. And I'm pretty sure physicians would General, unless you had a PhD, you would be considered a craftsman. Uh, but he felt that the guardian class was so important that they should not be able to just leave um, their progeny to chance. He felt that the guardian class should have uh, their marriages all arranged so that by the state, so the state could control what the guardian class will, be, will become through their children. And uh, he thought this was a great idea, but he knew enough about human beings and human nature to know that folks probably wouldn't go along with that. So he um, decided that, well, then the state needed to develop this noble lie. And um, 
say you're having a marriage lottery and make it look like it's random, but in the background, the state is of course stuffing the ballot boxes if you would, if, if you would like. Um, they're, they're actually saying, okay, this, this person needs to, to be with this person so that we have this great guardian class. And it may sound kind of crazy, but you know, th this, his, his ideas were very popular. Uh, in both Athens and Sparta, they had um, civil leaders or civic leaders, sorry, who would uh, actually take a look at the babies when they're born and make sure that they were going to be okay. And if not, they were discarded. Um, and in Rome, uh, they did this as well. In fact, in uh, the Roman table of law, table number four stated that any deformed babies, any deformed children needed to be, they must be euthanized. And when I was reading about that, it reminded me of this. So I hope this works. This is just a little um, segment from uh, the movie 300, which is about the Spartans, the 300 Spartans who, who fought uh, Xerxes and his army. And um, I got to see that first time at the IMAX, it was really cool to see a huge Gerard Butler. But uh, here's a, just a little uh, snippet from that film about eugenics. When the boy was born, like old Spartans, he was inspected. If he'd been small and puny, or sickly, or misshapen, he would have been discarded. Yeah, told you it was a short segment. All right, let me get to the, no, 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 we don't want to do it. We want to go to the next slide. Okay, there we go. So we're going to jump forward a little bit in our history lesson uh, to uh, a 19th century Englishman who is considered the father of modern eugenics, and that's Sir Francis Galton. Uh, Sir Francis Galton was a very interesting person, and you need to look up some of his um, his life story because it's fascinating, but he was trained as a physician. Uh, what really turned him on was stats, uh, so he was a, a great statistician, and he's the one who came up with this concept of chi-square. He's also the fellow who came up with the concept of using fingerprints as identification because he uh, discovered that they were all unique. Um, but what's most interesting about this guy and how he becomes the father of modern eugenics is that he was the cousin of a Charles Darwin that you may have heard of. And he thought you could apply the concept of survival of the fittest to, the home, uh, to human society. And so that's where he's the one who termed, came up with the term eugenics believing that talent and genius were genetic traits, he also believed that one must change societal policies that protected the underprivileged and the weak or those who would pass on defective genes. In uh, 1869, he published uh, this book, which I found extremely dry because it was full of pedigrees and, and things like that. Uh, but it's uh, called Hereditary Genius. And, and he believed that this work showed through his research that there was an inheritance of abilities. And near the end of the book on page 343, he states, it may seem monstrous that the weak should be crowded out by the strong, but it is still more monstrous that the races best fitted to play their part on the stage of life should be crowded out by the incompetent, the ailing, and the desponding. I'm not even sure what the desponding is, but anyway, meanwhile, back in the United States, this is what was going on at about that time. And um, after, after the Civil War, we had some increased, civil, uh, increased immigration um, and people started to become uh, concerned because uh, they, they think all of these immigrants are going to be bringing their defective genes into the American gene pool and we've got to do something about it. 
So um, in 1909, uh, there was a eugenics committee established. And in 1924, the Johnson Reed Act or the Immigration Act was passed and became federal law, which limited the immigration of certain populations. And the way they did this was they, they, they had this quota percentage based on the 1890 census so that they could discriminate against more recent immigrants than that. And this almost entirely prevented Asians from being able to immigrate to the United States and greatly decreased the, the Slavs and the Italians as well. And then you'll see, also see it was only a couple of years later that the American Eugenics Society was founded. The father of American eugenics is Charles Davenport. And uh, Dr. Davenport was a zoologist from Harvard. And he too believed that talent and intelligence were single gene traits. Now, Davenport formed the eugenics section of the American Breeders Association. Now, this American Breeders Association was uh, established by uh, agricultural um, folks, agricultural scientists, but um, Davenport felt that the American Breeders Association would fit in nicely as a platform for eugenics. And this mission below there, that was Davenport's mission for the eugenics arm, was to identify the most defective and undesirable Americans, at least 10% of the population, after identifying that submerged 10th, appropriate remedies or solutions would be used to identify defer defective germplasm and terminate those bloodlines. So Davenport established the eugenics record office for the purpose of collecting pedigrees. And they collected, I went the wrong direction. Uh, they collected uh, hundreds of thousands of different pedigrees of Americans. And that was the purpose was to find that submerged 10th. In 1911, this committee uh, put out a report of some of these remedies or solutions to eliminating some of those um, bloodlines. And point eight, by the way, was euthanasia. This was 1911 in the United States of America. Um, and in 1938, uh, there was the foundation of the Euthanasia Society of America. Many in mental institutions, by the way, and physicians had developed innovative ways to practice, practice passive euthanasia. For example, in Lincoln, Illinois, which is just down the road from where I grew up, they had a, uh, a mental institution. And um, there was a time that they decided that they would feed incoming patients milk from tubercular cows with the thought that the strong individuals should be immune to tuberculosis. Um, this resulted in a 30 to 40% death rate in Lincoln, Illinois at their mental institution. Meanwhile, eugenics was considered the latest and greatest in scientific modernism. Um, there were many popular elitists who were prominent supporters of eugenics in the United States and promoted it highly. And among those was H.G. Wells, George Bernard Shaw, which for funsies, if you don't have anything else to do this afternoon, go to YouTube, look up George Bernard Shaw, and uh, there is a little segment where he says that he feels that people should be brought before a committee and um, they should prove that in what way they are helpful to society and why they should continue to live. George Bernard Shaw. Uh, Margaret Sanger, we know that name, uh, Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, David Starr Jordan, Alex, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, Charles Lindbergh, Winston Churchill, William Keith Kellogg, 
the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Institute. Um, those who were the most vocal critics of eugenics, this may sound familiar, and uh, eugenics policies were labeled as reactionary and anti-scientific. So in order to try to promote the concept of eugenics in middle America, they came up with these fitter family contests. They were often supported by local health departments and other organizations. And what people would do, they would have these at state fairs or agricultural fairs and uh, people would apply uh, to, to be considered the fitter family and get an award. And some of the things that they um, had to do was, okay, you had to have a full uh, medical and social history on each of the family members. Each of the family members had labs drawn, uh, had your analysis, personality tests, IQ tests, and then all of the, the families that had entered the contest were graded. And whoever got the best grade was given this award. Uh, and then they were also encouraged to have large families so that they could promote these good uh, traits in, in their community. Now, you might think that this was just uh, promoted um, by, uh, you know, your, your white uh, Protestant um, middle class folks, but it was also promoted uh, in the, the Black Americans by W.E.B. Du Bois, for instance, who was a, a sociologist and civil rights activist and an author, he supported eugenics to advance the black race. And the NAACP actually would have fit baby contests, much like these fitter family contests. Um, out of that, however, did come the assimilation eugenics, which uh, they felt that the talented 10th of all races should uh, mix so that you would thereby have uh, more diversity and you might have some uh, superhuman, let's say like Derek Jeter. I'm a big fan. Uh, here's a poster that was uh, at a, a eugenics conference in 1921. If all marriages were gen eugenic, we could breed out most of this unfitness in three generations. Margaret Sanger, who is the founder of what would later become Planned Parenthood, embraced negative eugenics as a way to reduce the reproduction of the unfit, believing that the weak should be allowed to die off. Now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this fella. Uh, this is Harry H. Laughlin. He is the father of state-sponsored sterilization. This fellow was born in Iowa, but he spent his youth in Kirksville, Missouri. And uh, there he was a teacher, a principal, and eventually superintendent of the Kirksville schools. In 1907, his interest in breeding experiments led him to contact Charles Davenport, remember the father of American eugenics. And Davenport eventually asked him to be the superintendent of the eugenics record office. Remember the eugenics record office is the one that collected all those pedigrees on Americans, right? Um, Laughlin also served as a eugenics expert for the Federal Committee on Immigration and Naturalization. Hmm, a eugenics expert talking to the Federal Committee on Immigration and Naturalization. And interestingly, he received an honorary degree from the University of Heidelberg, Germany in 1936. What was happening in Germany in the 1930s? Very interesting, huh? So now we're gonna talk about the history of state-sponsored sterilization. Actually, in 1907, the state of Indiana was the first state that passed a state law um, that would um, force sterilization on certain people 
um, in, in their population. But in, it wasn't spreading. The concept was not spreading the way Laughlin would have liked. So in 1922, he published a model eugenical sterilization law. And as you recall with model uh, legislations, uh, they create this and they send it out to all their people so that they can go to their state legislature and say, hey, this is a, this is a great law. It's going to help uh, our um, communities greatly. And um, so this is what his um, model law stated. It was, uh, it was to encompass the feeble-minded, the insane, criminalistic, epileptic, inebriate, diseased, blind, deaf, deformed, and dependent, including orphans, ne'er-do-wells, tramps, the homeless, and paupers. This was to be the focus for forced sterilization, okay? Now, I love karma. Um, Laughlin himself eventually discovered that he suffered from epilepsy, which, as you see above, is one of the subjects uh, and criteria for sterilization under his own model law. One of the most infamous US Supreme Court cases is this uh, 1927 US Supreme Court case, Buck versus Bell. 17 year old Carrie Buck was the first person chosen by the state of Virginia to be uh, sterilized. She had been institutionalized um, after um, she was raped by a, a family member of her foster folks. They just put her in institution once she became pregnant. And uh, that's where she had her baby was in the institution. And the institution, uh, the superintendent of that institution felt that um, Carrie had inherited the, um, the trait of promiscuity because her mother had been a prostitute. That's how Carrie got into the foster system in the first place. So this case went all the way to the US Supreme Court, as I said, and it was um, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. himself who, whose decision upheld the Virginia law. And here's a portion of, of his decision. He stated, we have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sapped the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices, often not felt to be such by those concerned, in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Now, while uh, they had uh, supported, the, the U.S. Supreme Court had supported uh, Buck versus Bell, they felt that the Oklahoma law went a little far uh, because Jack Skinner uh, was a, a chicken thief. So they struck down the Oklahoma law, but based only on the grounds of equal protection. You see, white collar felons were not being sterilized, whereas petty criminals, such as a chicken thief, um, were. And so the Supreme Court felt that it might be okay to sterilize the mentally defective, but they didn't feel that forced sterilization would be helpful in fighting crime. In North Carolina, an IQ of 70 or lower qualified individuals for forced sterilization. And during the 1930s, 38 state legislatures enacted sterilization laws regarding the feeble-minded. 
and over 64,000 individuals between 1907 and 1963 were forcibly sterilized under eugenic legislation. Now, what about the great state of Missouri? This is interesting. Representative George E. Ballew um, had uh, developed House Bill 290 that in 1929 was uh, first filed. He filed it again in 1931, filed again in 1933, 1935, 1937. And you see that it targeted various criminals, uh, those convicted of murder, not in the heat of passion, of course, rape, highway robbery, again, chicken stealing. Now, I, I raise chickens and I might be a little upset if someone stole some of my chickens. I don't know that I would say, I'm sorry, but you have to be sterilized. Um, bombing, theft of automobiles, subsequent modifications to the, the, the bill included persons convicted of rape, incest, or sodomy, habitual criminals or imbeciles or idiots or incurable insane persons or persons inflicted with incurable venereal disease or incurable epileptics. By the way, none of those ever passed. So the state of Missouri is not one of the states that had forced sterilization laws. Woo, woo. So eugenics basically thrived in the 1930s as it evolved from a top-down elitist forming an ideal society concept to a bottom-up um, take responsibility for the good of the community. So thus endeth the history lesson. Um, let's now turn to the present and the 21st century. Now remember my, my first slide. There is nothing new under the sun. Ideas this ancient and this deep seated don't just go away. They're going to change their name. They'll change their vehicles. They may shift a little bit, but they never go away. So this fella, um, I was a microbiology major uh, and, and life science. What really turned me on was molecular genetics. So um, I love this picture, by the way. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Watson, who was the co-discoverer of the double helix. But Dr. Watson believed very much in eugenics. And he stated, once you have a way in which you can improve our children, no one can stop it. So what was really missing in um, the, 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 the 19th and the 20th century eugenics, thanks to the mapping of the human genome, kind of fills the hole, um, the hole that they had in their understanding. So today we have a new definition of eugenics. It's the study of human genetics and of methods to improve the inherited characteristics, physical and mental, of the human race, also known as procreative beneficence, giving children the best in life. It's for the children. So we start with prenatal and post-pregnancy screening, uh, parental screening. Uh, I don't know if when, when you had your kids or if you've ever done any um, obstetrics that you uh, had to ask the, the, the questions about uh, you or any, anyone in your family uh, ever had. And it's up to 400 genetic conditions that parents are screened for. Uh, and then there's amniocentesis, you know, where they take samples of the amniotic fluid looking for certain fetal conditions like trisomy. Uh, and then there's also a newborn screening. And this is greatly expanded. I, uh, I, I took a look at the Missouri uh, law here. You can look this up if you'd like. But this is a list of the um, newborn screening that is done. I don't know if y'all can see that, but that's just a, that's, that's quite a list of, uh, of things that newborns are screened for. And that's all very well and good, but my question is this, in the law, um, a specimen shall be taken from 
all infants before being discharged from the hospital or birthing facility, regardless of age of the, the newborn, uh, if it is discovered or highly suspected that a child has never received a newborn screen, a newborn screen is recommended regardless of the child's age. Parents who object to testing on religious grounds shall state those objections in writing. Now that doesn't really tell me whether um, they don't screen the newborns if the parents object to it. And number five, parents or guardians who object to the storage or release of their child's leftover newborn screening specimens for anonymous research shall state those objections in writing. To me, this is very similar to forced pedigree. And who knows what happens to the sample that is taken. Now we have some pre-implantation diagnosis also. This is where in, you know, in, uh, in vitro, where they have the embryos, the embryos are examined prior to implantation, looking for chromosomal aberrations, and the parent or parents decide which embryos are going to be implanted. I suppose the parents have that choice. I do not know what happens to the embryos that are not implanted, though I can guess. Now we're going to uh, talk about genetic engineering. There's positive genetic engineering and there's negative eugenic, uh, genetic engineering. In positive genetic engineering, that's the process of enhancing the genes that are there. But negative genetic engineering is the process of altering or removing genes that can cause disease. Um, now, you all remember the difference between genotype and phenotype. Genotype is uh, the genetic makeup of an organism, and the phenotype is the observable characteristics or traits. It's the expression of genes. And not everyone who has a gene is going to have that gene expressed. Are we, are we clear on that? Oh, good. All right. And uh, I don't have time to talk to you about this cool Hardy-Weinberg genotype equilibrium calculator, but it is very, very cool if you want to look that up. Um, it can help you uh, calculate the, the likelihood of um, this is the genetic makeup of this uh, parent and this is the genetic uh, makeup of this parent, whether it's a plant, whether it's an animal, whether it's a human, and the likelihood of that genetic, uh, that gene or gene sequence being transmitted uh, to the offspring. And then the phenotypic ratio is um, a ratio that, that uh, talks about a, a characteristic and the likelihood that that characteristic, you know, what's the ratio that it's going to be expressed. If you have a tall plant and a small plant and you put those two together, what percentage of the offspring are gonna be tall and what percentage of the offspring are gonna be small. And I wanted to remind you of that before we talked about uh, genetic engineering. Somatic genetic engineering is a negative uh, genetic engineering in that um, it takes specific genes and spe specific tissues and modifies them. This has been going on since 1990, but it does not affect eggs or sperm and therefore it does not alter the individual's genetic makeup. So this is um, trying to, to help treat disease through somatic genetic engineering. That's different from germline genetic engineering. In mitochondrial therapy, uh, you take diseased mitochondria and replace them. So you take those out and you replace them with mitochondria from a healthy donor. This changes this creates changes in a person that will be passed down. And a mistake that is made here will be a permanent mistake. So that's the difference between somatic and germline genetic engineering. Then we've got, oh, plasm transfer. 
in this, you're not trying to cure disease. What you're doing is you're trying to enhance fertility. So the fetus will have DNA from two females and one male. Uh, they've had about two dozen babies born this way. The FDA stopped this in uh, 2002, but they are reconsidering it. And I ask you, I mean, really, what's, what's the worst that could happen? I just love Hugh Jackman. Okay, sorry. Um, so that gets us to this concept of reprogenetics and designer babies. Uh, this, this is where you modify the embryos, not for health reasons now. We're beyond uh, treating disease. Now we're modifying them for the sake of improvement. If that's not eugenics, I don't know what is. Um, but you're like, okay, well, this would never happen, right? This is just something that scientists sit around and they talk about. And, and um, but in November, 2018, at the International Summit on Human Gene Editing, there was a Chinese researcher who announced that he had created the world's first genetically modified babies. Now he was criticized but not around heritable genome editing or the concept of these CRISPR babies. Rather, he, it was the timing of his research that was criticized. The world's not quite ready, they said, for genetically modified children. I would like to note that in 2014, there were 13 members of the California State, Assem uh, State Assembly Health Committee that voted down a bill that would have outlawed the practice of sex selection through abortion. Let me read that again. They voted down a bill in committee that would make it illegal to use abortion to choose the sex of a baby. Genetic diversity is extremely important. If, if there's one thing that I, uh, reading of Darwin's research and the, the wonders that he found on the Galapagos Islands, what he's talking about is that in nature, uh, genetic diversity is extremely important. And using these kind of um, eugenic policies could lessen genetic diversity. And then as with genetically modified crops, we know about our GMO corn and soybeans and canola, um, a host of unforeseen and deleterious consequences may develop. But again, I ask what is the worst that could happen, right? Might manipulations of certain personal characteristics that while possibly leading toward criminal behavior also eliminate the warriors the population might need to defend itself. If back to who gets to decide, if they decide that, um, you know, you could, you could, so if you're trying to um, develop this guardian class and you focus too much on the philosophers and not enough on the warriors, what's going to happen to that society, right? And conditions can be viewed as either disabling or empowering, depending on one's point of view. Do remember Dr. Temple Grandin. And then I have a few other questions. Who will exercise control? Who decides? Who decides what genes are defective? Who decides what is abnormal behavior? Who decides the genetic worth of prospective human beings? And then as a Hippocratic physician, I have a lot of problem with this concept of eugenics because it elevates the rights of the population above the individual. The population is made up of individuals. But when I took my oath, I took an oath to treat the individual first, individualizing treatment, which is a Hippocratic medicine tenet. It seems to me that the concept of eugenics 
is really a question of nature versus, versus nurture. I'm looking to see what time it is. I lost my phone somewhere. Uh, do we have, uh, Jeremy, do we have time for me to tell about a, a five to 10 minute story? I Absolutely, please, okay. yes. I, All right. Yeah, thank you. So uh, it seems to me that the concept of eugenics is a question of nature versus nurture, which is a thought that has always fascinated me. How much of who we are as an individual is determined by our genetic makeup and how much from the environment from which we came? Because eugenics really is uh, all based on genes, right? Well, let me tell you a story that I think is a great study of nature versus nurture. Once upon a time, there was a lady who was, uh, as a girl, she was one of six children of a uh, poor Kentucky tobacco sharecropper. And um, they were poor and Catholic, and um, but he was uh, working as a sharecropper on, on this uh, tobacco farm. And one year, uh, right after harvest, there was a devastating fire in a barn that held 100% of their harvest. And so that ended that, and they, uh, he had to do something. Uh, he picked up his family and they moved to central Illinois and he started working just as a farm hand. So they continued to be poor folks. Um, when she was in high school, she met a sailor who uh, swept her off her feet and um, she became pregnant, got married, uh, graduated high school as a married mother and uh, just loved being a mother. And so uh, unfortunately her husband was not into having any more children. He said, no, one was enough. And um, women being women, uh, since she wanted to have a baby, she managed to get pregnant by him again, which really uh, made him quite angry. So he picked up the family, her and, and the two kids now, and moved to Washington DC uh, because he felt that uh, her family was a bad influence, you know. Uh, and there he went to police academy. While she was working, um, she met another sailor who was married and had two children. He was from California. He swept her off her feet and they had an affair and she became pregnant. And he tried to encourage her to move back to California. They, they would uh, raise that baby together. And she said, no, I can't leave my other children. And uh, she was estranged from her husband at that time. So um, the boyfriend went back home to his wife and children in California. And her estranged husband said, if you will give this baby up for adoption, then we can work on the marriage. So she uh, went to a Catholic uh, home for unwed mothers, had the baby, gave the baby up for adoption uh, after uh, three days. And um, then within a month, the husband filed uh, papers for divorce, getting full custody of the children because she was an unfit mother. And this was the 19, uh, you know, this was 1961. So back then that uh, was probably very common. At any rate, uh, this lady, um, ended up remarrying, but here she was, she had lost her first three children, two to her uh, first husband, a third one to adoption. And um, so she remarried quickly because the only thing she ever really wanted to do was to be a mama. And she had four children. Unfortunately, that husband was an alcoholic and was abusive. And eventually um, she ended up divorcing him as well, but not until the children were raised. Meanwhile, the boyfriend uh, had had another child and um, he ended up divorcing his wife as well. So the situation for uh, the two oldest children was not the best. Um, her first husband ended up marrying like five times and uh, they didn't have a good stable uh, childhood. The four children that she had with the uh, alcoholic did not have good childhoods. Um, the childhoods of the, uh, the, the three in California were not uh, that great as well. Meanwhile, the baby given up for adoption 
was adopted by a family that had adopted a baby girl about five years before. Um, they provided that baby with a stable nurturing environment. And uh, that older sister actually taught that baby girl how to read when the baby girl was four. And I think that made all the difference in the world. So the lady on the left there, that is, uh, that's her picture, that's her senior picture. And the picture on the right is the picture of her seeing that baby she gave up for adoption um, 58 years later. I bring you this story because I'm thankful that neither of those people were sterilized because they had uh, inherited the trait of promiscuity. When we're considering policies, that you suspect are influenced by eugenics. I beg you to remember the individual before the general population, because you just might save a Dr. Temple Grandin or a Dr. Jenny Powell. And that is all I have. <laughs>